Hi everyone. Counting down. I would count numbers, but I don't know when it finishes. Hello. Um, hi. Nice to nice to see you all today. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Hi to you too, Ryan. Um, I'm excited to keep chatting. Hi, Jongbin. Izzy. Whoever else. I'll try and always say hi to people who say hi in the chat. <laughs> Make you feel connected. Um, I had one of my favorite YouTubers the other day. I'm not telling you who. They did a live stream at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And I like got on and I was just like, I'm going to make them acknowledge me. And it was like, you know, 400 people watching live. And um, yeah, they did. So it was good for me. Um, hi, Tom, Maria, me and Diamuid. Diamuid? Um, Tim, Ricky, <laughs> Sam, George, Suresh, Sam, um, making you all come to life here. So, um, and Gayathri, all right, I'm done now. Okay, that's it. Everyone else, I'll just do a blanket high. So, uh, welcome to uh, STL Algorithms. Um, this is the last part of week two. And so, just for context, because, I'll uh, just repeat this again. Because we don't have a Monday lecture in week four, it's likely that we'll have to start this topic today, potentially, maybe not, but we'll have to do, oh, we'll have to do these two next week. We'll figure it out, but we just have to juggle some things around. Um, Richard says, why a giraffe? That'll be the last uh, um, kind of, you know, off topic question I answer for now, but uh, I just think giraffes are str strange animals and I, I adore them for their weirdness. Like. I don't know what's going on with their necks. That's about it. They're just weird, weird, weird creatures. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, when I said do these things, I, I got that confused. I meant like um, we'll have to do these in week four. Like we just have to figure out how to do because this is like this is this is basically seven hours of lectures that we had eight hours to do, but now we have six, which will be fine. It's just like they won't all fall nicely into a gap. That's all I'm saying. I mentioned that yesterday. But let's get on to STL algorithms. So last two lectures we covered um, STL containers, we covered STL iterators, we looked at doing some basic things with them, basically just like storing stuff, iterating through them, um, everything like that. And today we're going to actually look at what algorithms STL provide us. Um, and <clears throat> we kind of touched on this yesterday, but STL algorithms are basically functions that execute an algorithm based on an abstract notion of a pointer. So, you know, if you think about, um, uh, you think about binary search or something, right? Like if you were to write a binary search in C, you would actually maybe, you know, you might have this like abstract data type or something, right? That's all we're really dealing with. It's just that we're trying to linearize things again. So today's a lot of going through some examples. Um, and a lot of them to do with algorithms, and we probably only need an hour, but um, what is the best way to sum a vector of numbers? So I've got this vector of numbers here. Vector int, nums, um, pretty straightforward, and if I want to sum them up, um, I would simply do a for loop like this, or I could use a for range loop or whatever. Um, but if we wanted to use an algorithm, to do these things, we would have to go beyond some of these simple examples, which I just mentioned, the iterator or the for range loop, and we would actually look at using a STL algorithm like this one here. So the difference here, you might be thinking, what's the point of this, right? Well, let's first look at the code. So the code is, sorry, I've just lost VLAB, VLAB. Um, so if I open up the code, and we go to demo 209, you can see here that compared to demo 208, which uses the four range loop, or this one, which uses the um, uh, the iterators kind of, and just iterates through them and sums them up, the accumulate function here just simply takes in nums begin and nums dot end and zero. So this is essentially a reduction function. So for anyone familiar with like map filter reduce functions, this is just a reduce function. Um, but it needs to know where the data structure starts and where the data structure ends. And that's why it takes in the dot begin and the dot end. Um, it also needs a zero because if you're accumulating something, if you're going through a reduction, you need to actually know what are you starting with. Um, 
So this function will take the beginning of a data structure, the end of a data structure, and it will add every element. It'll accumulate all the values of those elements with a base number of what you give it to start, which is here. And then if we go and build and run that, then uh, it'll work, right? Build lectures, lectures to um, end demo 209. 15, it works like that. Now we could have a look at this uh, particular library on CPP reference, um, standard accumulate, and you can see here that um, it is a C++ 20 feature. Okay, so it computes the sum of the given value init, right, which is the starting value, and the elements in the range first to last. The first version uses operator plus to sum up the element, the second version uses the given binary operator. So essentially what this is saying here is that um, you can call this accumulate um, given the first and last pointer and a basic and it will just do a standard plus equal like operator plus on them. So it'll just add them together. You know, it could be strings, ints, doubles, it doesn't matter. Like if a type has a notion of being able to sum two of them together, then you can pass it into accumulate because it will rely on the underlying type's ability to be summed together. Um, but in other cases, you might actually want to pass in a custom definition of how to actually sum those two things together. So, you know, there'll be some examples here. Um, oh, these are implementations, sorry. Yeah, some examples are using uh, standard accumulate. And you can actually see here without getting too into the weirdness, but um, the binary operator that you can give the accumulator is actually a, uh, I'm not sure if it's a value or object, but it's basically another part of the STL library, which is simply like, it's like a predicate or something where you give this to accumulate and it, it's like an instruction as to how to actually accumulate things. So accumulate by default, will be doing a like a summation. Um, whereas when we give it this multiplies object, it'll be uh, doing a multiplication. So this is kind of how you would accumulate numbers into a product because standard accumulate by itself will just do it um, as a sum. You know, and you can kind of take this further and further. And these are some more complex examples, but the point is it's a really nice abstraction um, where you just simply give a data structure's beginning and end. You give the accumulate algorithm. So this is an algorithm here using the begin and end iterator to effectively go through a data structure that is abstract as far as the algorithm's concerned. Um, and you give it a starting value and the actual what they call the binary operator. Basically, how do you operate on two values? Is it a plus? Is it a whatever? Um, and we could look at what standard multiplies is. Um, function object for performing multiplication effectively calls operator star on two instances of type T. Basically, this is just a, a function, if you will. Um, like if you want to think about it in like a more C-like fashion, imagine this is like a function pointer or you know, an anonymous function that you use to actually apply it as you're accumulating through it, right? Um, yeah, so the other one that exists, because you notice this is all C++20. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever Googled that. <laughs> STD reduce. There you go, everyone. Um, I'm going to be getting targeted ads for the next week. <laughs> I'm dying. Oh, that's so funny. For a second there, I was like, sometimes, you know, when you, uh, do you ever like want to Google something? You try and Google something and then your brain Google something else. And I was like, God, what did I Google? Um, how did I get here? But no, it's, I Googled the exact right thing. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, hope. <laughs> yeah, last time something like this happened, it ended up on discussion group. Um, oh, wow. Someone got an STD dating app after Googling STD libraries. So there's another function out there called standard reduce, which you'll notice actually looks pretty similar. It has like a input iterator to the first, input iterator to the last. Um, it doesn't seem to have that initial value. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, we can kind of look through it. Um, 
Reduce behaves like standard accumulate, except the elements of the range may be grouped and rearranged in arbitrary order. Hmm, interesting. Um, side by side comparison between reduce and accumulate. Okay, so what's happening here? We have, uh, where's our reduce? So we got standard accumulate, standard reduce. Doesn't really look that, like it's a little bit, I, I think standard accumulate came about to try and um, simplify uh, some, of, some of the reduce function because it's a pretty basic function like algorithm, right? It's something you'd ideally like to use a lot. Um, <laughs> so yeah, pretty much we use standard accumulate. So standard accumulate is a C++ 20 feature. If you're using older versions of C++, then you'll have to use a different algorithm. Um, but the point is, you might look at this and think, oh, um, <clears throat> this seems pointless. I know how to iterate through something. I don't need to use import and use an algorithm. But the whole point of good software design is that you are reusing semantics as much as you can. You are using libraries so that, you know, there's a common definition. It also allows you to do things like, what if someone's figured out a way to make this more optimal? Now, in this, this one's a pretty simple function. Um, but, you know, and it's implemented, this is like a rough implementation. This is kind of what you'd expect it to be, right? We'll get into templates later in the course, but, but yeah, in general, it's like, yeah, it's just a for loop, looping through each item and summing them up, right? Like it's not that complicated. So that's a simple example of algorithms. Now algorithms can get very complicated. Let's have a look at some more examples here. Now, this one was, uh, it shows a couple of things we've looked at. Um, I don't know why it's so hard to swap windows on my computer. God damn it. I just want to go to VLAB. Where's VLAB gone? There. Um, so we're going to open another one. 211 algos. So with this, you'll notice that we're using a whole range of algorithms here. Generally, anytime you see STD something, um, well, not like a whole range, but we have a few. So we've already talked about accumulate and we've already talked about multiplies like this. Um, but you know what? You can also figure out the midpoint of a uh, uh, data structure, right? Because if I go and get the begin iterator for a data structure, um, like a vector, and then I do like a plus equals, uh, you know, like for this vector here, for instance, if I say like, you know, um, auto it equals v dot begin. That's going to be a pointer to the first element. Then if I say it plus equals two, it's going to go from one to two and two to three. So now my pointer is to the third element or the midpoint, right? So I did a tutorial today, which you can look up the recording for on WebCMS3. I'd probably, I, there's a few things that I'll point you to the tutorial for, because um, I think the tutorial goes through a little bit of detail about this, but Generally speaking, with random access iterators, which is what the vector is, you're able to kind of jump randomly across this linear abstraction. So if you imagine your iterator is a linear abstraction of the um, the array, then you can basically just jump uh, jump to it. So that's what we're actually doing down here. When we want to find the midpoint or the like the midpoint pointer, we get v dot begin, which is a pointer to the beginning, and then we increment it by v size on two spots, which in this case is going to be, you know, five on two, because size is five, on two is 2.5, and it's an int, so it floors to two. So then we increment it by two. So this will actually give us a pointer to the, um, the midpoint. And then we can do some interesting things, for instance, like we can sum the first two numbers or sum everything up to the import, up to the midpoint, but not including it by saying that the sum two is standard accumulate from v dot begin, which is where we start, to midpoint, right? So those are both iterators, they're just in different spots. So instead of using v dot end all the way down here, we're using midpoint, which is an uh, iterator in the middle. And that's how we can kind of do like a little bit of an easier sum here. Now, you see there's a line commented out here, which uh, we say like might be a little bit harder to read. Um, and this is another way of calculating the midpoint if we need to here. Just trying to make this smaller. So here we say standard next v dot begin, standard distance v dot begin, v dot end on two. Um, 
you know, it's kind of like, I don't think full screen would help that much, but sure. Um, it's like, so in this case now, let's actually break down what some of these functions do. So we already understand what v.begin and v.end is, right? Um, though we have to ask ourselves the question, what the hell is this distance thing? So let's try printing that out. So we know what v.begin and v.end is. Let's actually print out what the distance is. So we'll say distance is that. And then I'll put a new line at the end, build to 11. Uh, midpoint 2 is... What's, what, why does it matter about that? Unused variable. Okay, let's comment that out for now. Build to 11. Oh, hello. Where'd everything go? There it is. Is it raining for everyone else as well? It's raining here. So now you can see that um, standard distance is literally like a counter. And you might be thinking, what in God's name is that for? Like, we already have a V dot size. Why do we need, a st why do we need an algorithm that's standard distance that goes from like, you know, um, the beginning of an iterator to the end. Like, does anyone know? Like, why do we need that? Let's look it up. Let's have a play with it. Be scared to Google things for a while. Um, the number of increments needed to go from first to last. Okay, why do we use it? it returns the number of hops from first to last. Any ideas, anyone? I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm actually asking this as an open question. I could have some guesses. I'm just curious what your guesses are. Any ideas? A hop's like a step. The length might not be equal to the number of elements. Yeah, so I think there's two things that I thought about, and there's probably something else, is that number one is there's there could perhaps be some data structures. Oh, that's even better. Okay, so there's a few things we've nailed here. Number one, there might be perhaps be some data structures who, when you iterate over it, doesn't give you all of the elements for some reason, right? I don't know if that even exists, but like that's a theoretical case where you could want to use it. Um, another reason is if you have some kind of structure that doesn't actually have a sense of its own size. So a really good example of this might be a... Um, like if you want to uh, count how many steps there are when you're iterating through a file, right? Um, so, because there are some iterators that I talked about in my tutorial today where like a file stream, where like if you get a, an input file stream iterator, like you're iterating through a file that you've opened to get all the elements, the file doesn't really know how big it is sometimes, right? There are some circumstances where the thing you're iterating through doesn't actually bother to keep track of the distance, like how it's sized. Because we learned this last night that a standard list knows what its size is, right? Because it just stores that as part of the structure. It has a size. Um, but if a structure doesn't have that, maybe the only way to actually get the size is to iterate through it. Um, again, I'm not sure what data structures would do that. Probably none, but it's an interesting thought about like what the benefit of that is. I think forward list has a size as well. I can't see why all of these structures wouldn't have a size. <gasps> Does it? Oh, maybe it doesn't. Max size? Oh, maybe it doesn't. I I don't really I've never really used a forward list in my life. I always just use lists, but there you go. Maybe that's what it is. Um, more space efficient storage. There you go. Maybe I'm missing something here, but like this would be a case, right? If if I'm right about this, is that it doesn't store its own size, so you actually need to like um, look it up. So. <laughs> What, what I'm most interested in, though, is trying to figure out... Um, they're, they're very theoretical, right? Like, yeah, okay, I, I might have found one here, but I like what... So I'm just trying to find the comment. I was, like, staring off into the distance. So, yeah, Jonah, there it is. So perhaps you don't want to start at the beginning. 
Now this actually makes sense because what we the function we actually have here, which is standard distance, um, it's actually asking for the distance not between the start and the end of a container, but for two iterators. So you might actually, for instance, want to figure out, you might find a particular iterator in the middle of a container that you're looking for, and then you might want to say how many elements exist after it. And that's what standard distance can, can be used for, because you can simply say, all right, well, this is the distance from, say, a midpoint or some random thing till the end. So it's, a, it's not really like the most efficient thing you might want to use. And in general, a lot of these algorithms are not going to be faster than ON. Like, if you're trying to sum something up or loop through something or find something, it's like they're all going to be ON because iterators are a linear abstraction of a container. And since they're a linear abstraction of a container, um, they're not going to be fancy and fast and stuff. So this will give us the distance. This will give us an integer. And let me just replace this here now, um, because we know standard distance of this will give us all the elements, which is 5 on 2, which we know floors to 2. So now, um, I'm going to try and get the midpoint by using standard next. And what does standard next do? Uh, up the top here. Return the nth successor of iterator it. So what's the difference between standard next and standard... Uh, what was the other one? The one we just used. Did I just delete it? I did. Um, distance. Okay, so there's another thing we use today in the shoot that I want to quickly look up with you here, which is that we use standard advance in the shoot. Now, standard advance we used in the shoot which kind of had a similar looking code example whereby you would get an iterator and then you would advance it by a certain number of spots. Does anyone know quickly what the difference between standard next and standard advance would be? So standard next says return the nth successor of iterator it. Sure, somebody knows. Again, I know there's a YouTube lag, so I just usually wait. Alvin says, Alwyn, sorry. Alwyn says the iterator stays the same. Yes, so that's kind of the, the big thing is that standard next um, actually returns you a new iterator. So you give it an iterator. You say, I want you to tell me what is like X steps past that. And then it gives you that new iterator without actually modifying the argument you've given it. Whereas standard advance actually modifies the argument. So you can see here, we give it v.begin, um, we advance it by two, and the actual iterator itself has changed. So what it abstractly points to is now different. It's two extra. So, like, one thing you're probably noticing already is that, like, the STL library for algorithms, I mean, there's a lot more than this, but it's not full of like, you know, huge fanciful things like calculate the shortest path in a graph. It's full of really basic fundamental algorithms, which are designed to standardize your code so that when someone reads your code and they understand these algorithms, it's not full of loops and all these other things, but it's full of really clear like, okay, we're advancing this iterator by this length and stuff like that. So that's why even though you see lines like this here, which look complicated, you can actually look at it and say, all right, well, this is actually going to go from v.begin and it's going to get me the iterator that is exactly um, this many steps further, which is just the distance to the end divided by two, which is just the midpoint, right? Um, so some other questions that have come up in the chat. So Richard says, would advance be more efficient to use then? Um, I guess... So, oh, irrelevantly, I don't, I don't think there'd be much. Um, you're basically saying, what's the cost of returning a variable, which is negligible. Um, <coughs> but it, it exists. Yes, it, it would be, I guess, probably more performant, but I don't know if that would matter. Um, Ryan says, is there a performance benefits to using accumulate or algorithms, or is it just for readability to use algos? So, Back to the first kind of slide of C++ that we did, the, the design principle of C++ is that, you know, you have languages like C which are really efficient because they lack abstractions, but they are really 
uh, yeah, they're really efficient because they lack abstractions, but they're really hard to make clean, readable code. And then on the other end here, you have your like Pythons and Javas and stuff, which are kind of like more abstract programs that are just really um, inefficient because their abstractions are heavy, right? So lightweight abstraction is kind of this key word we want to think about with all of these things. And that's the design principle that is often used with C++. Um, and a big part of that is that the, the principle is that if you're trying to find the next iterator, if you're trying to find the distance between these two, if you're trying to um, advance it, if you're trying to accumulate it, the abstractions that the um, STL algorithms provide you should have a f essentially no performance penalty as opposed to if you implemented these algorithms yourself trivially using the iterators. So the idea is that you shouldn't be punished for using these libraries. And so in most cases, they're not going to be slower. The only times you're really going to see STL algorithms be slower is when you're, which we'll show, I'll show you an example with maps and find, but it's basically whenever <coughs> the container itself has a faster way to do things. But if you're talking about working with iterators that the container provides, then most of the time the algorithms will be at, at worst the same as yours and at best faster. Okie dokie. So um, that was a fun little interesting example with Accumulate. Um, and this is actually exactly what I was talking about um, to do with find, except we might not, we might not actually go too deep into that yet. Sorry, let me just jump ahead so I can. No, let's talk about it now. Let's talk about find now. So um, this was also covered in my tutorial today. We're going to have a look at <coughs> demo 212. So here um, we have a vector and we want to find something in the vector. We want to get the, the, a, an abstract pointer, an iterator, to one of the values in that vector. And we do so by saying that an iterator um, is equal to standard find and then we give it the start, the end iterator, and a needle, right? Like a needle in a haystack. Except the haystack here is represented by the begin and the end iterator. Um, this makes sense and standard find returns you an iterator to the element and if it can't find it, it returns you um, the equivalent of the end iterator, right? So if you imagine that nums.end is effectively null, um, then what you're really saying here is like if standard find can't find the element you're looking for, it will simply return null. So I'm looking for it, and if the iterator it gives me is not the same as nums.end, as in it did find something, then I can print out found it, and I can actually print out the value of the iterator itself. And then we can try and compile and run that. So found it for, right? So we found the number four successfully. If we can't find it, then the iterator value will be something else. And I'll show you this, right? So. If I try and actually, let's just even try and print out the iterator value here. Let me make this a bit smaller again. Uh, standard C out, let's try and print out the iterator. So if we can't find it, so let's search for six. Okay, so you can see it's printing out this, these random numbers here. And, and what these numbers are is, I don't know, I, I think they're probably random ints because trying to dereference uh, an end iterator is undefined behavior. So um, it doesn't return null. I, I said it's like the concept of null in terms of, um, in theory, this points, like the iterator abstractly points to the memory address, theoretically, one past the end of the array. Um, so it's not null in this case, but it might be. Um, for instance, if you try and print out the address, or if I just try and print out the iterator itself, let's see what it does. Nope. It won't let me. It's like, sorry, but you can't do that. Um, it's, yeah, it's just grumpy. I could try and void star. I don't want to get into that. Um, so, or the address of the iterator? No, nah, let's not do that. So, um, that's how you'd find something. Now, um, who's asked the question? Someone said about linear. Yeah, so Gert says, is find a linear time process? Yes, yeah, so 
pretty much every STL algorithm is a best case ON algorithm. Well, I guess I could be better. I should say that like pretty much all um, STL algorithms probably have a uh, average case of zero unless they're using a random access iterator, which you can use on vectors. So you could actually binary search a vector if it was sorted, um, which is an interesting idea. But generally for something like find, because it can only get the start and the end, it can only iterate through it linearly, um, then it's going to be, you know, it's going to be uh, ON. Yeah, so I'll show you another example. Let's make a list, and this will be a list of ints, and I'll call it nums2. And this will be like um, one, or map, sorry, let's do a map. Um, yeah, so map, and uh, we'll insert things into the map. How do we do that again? We go, um, I should do it the proper way that we talked about, nums2 equals this. And then we do in place, um, we can be a map of ints to doubles, sure. In place 1 to 1.0, and we'll do this for a few of them. Now, in this case here, let's see if this works. So I'm just going to replace my nums reference with nums2, and we're going to build it and run it. No, we're not. What have I done wrong here? I mean, I need to include map. That's probably one thing I've forgotten. I don't think that was the issue though, was it? Nope. I've tried to print out an iterator. So what did we learn yesterday when we looked at the maps is that the iterator to a map is actually a, um, uh, if it's a pair, right? It has two elements. So we need to go, we need to do something like this and actually say second here. Um, because the iterator will give us the actual pair, it'll give us the key and the value in the map. And again, I'm probably forgetting something more. Thanks everyone for pointing out my nums2 issue. Um, what's this one now? Ah, C++ errors. I love them so much. They make me really happy. What's the problem? Invalid operands to binary Oh, this is weird. I have no idea what's going on here. Anyone have any big brain ideas? Yeah, I know six isn't in there, but that shouldn't be giving us a compile error. We're getting some template, some really strange errors. Oh, it should be a pair. Gotcha. Thank you. I get what you're saying. Um, so we can do standard pair and then we'll do int uh, double looking for a 1 and 1.0 like that. I think that should work. So here we're constructing a type called pair which is the same as the map templates except we have that. So let's try let's try this. No. Have I done this wrong now? So strange. to the top. Yes, no, there is a find. Maybe maybe that maybe you can't actually stand a find should work. I'm about to get into the nums2.find thing. I'm just not sure why the um include pair. I don't think it's that. What is it? Invalid operands to binary expression. I just find these let's 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 Google it. So we got standard map, standard map, standard find. I don't want to, here we go, algorithm, standard find with standard map. Hopefully I'm not making this up. No, okay. Bugger. Alright, so, oh, no, that should be fine. So, the point, the point I was trying to make here, which I'm just going to abandon, is that while there are, um, I should have written an example for this in advance, but while there are certain cases where like you could say linear, like you could get a map and iterate through it, right? Like we've, we've seen this before, we did this yesterday where we could say, um, 
you know, for auto it equals nums two dot begin. Uh, it is not equal to nums two dot end and plus plus it. And then we could print them out by simply going like uh, you know standard C out um, it dot second, which will get us the value, for instance. And I'll just comment this out for a sec. So we know that we can iterate through a map. And we know that it will give us the values there. However, if we want to use find on it, which we could if I was smarter, um, we would be doing it in on time, right? Because as far as the algorithm is capable of, standard find has to take a linear representation of a data structure to find something. So this is us using standard find, the STL algorithm, um, on a standard map, the STL container. But if you actually go to standard map, I'll look up make pair in a sec, we can try that out. If you look up standard map, you'll actually notice in its um, list of functions that it has a lookup function called find. And this lookup function called find takes in a certain key. So um, if we just try for a second what people have suggested in the um, uh, chat, which is make pair, which I remember that I just don't make pairs much. Build two on two. Eh. I think it takes parentheses as a function call. I don't know. Nah. Nah, I'm digging deep. I'm suffering sunk cost fallacy right now. I'm so desperate to make it work that I can't deal with the thought of it not working. I don't know. Okay. Point is, point is, irrespective of this, this is such a rabbit hole. It's fun, it's, it's fun to talk about this stuff because I, I like to remind people that this is a hard language to program in and that like you, it's not just like as quick and zippy as something like Python, but it actually like is a little bit indirect sometimes, um, which can be fun for the first couple of minutes. But here's the thing. We have in the map in nums2 a function called find which takes in a key. So if I want to look up, say, 1, instead of having to use standard find, I could use nums.find. And nums.find returns me an iterator as well. So I could simply here say auto it equals nums.find, and then I could copy this. And check this, you know, is it equivalent to the end? If, and if it's not, I found it. And then I could just print the iterator dereference. Because, um, at least I think I could. Maybe not. I think the iterator might be... No, 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 I need to do this. Because all iterators to maps are with the pair. Yes. Okay. So we did find it in this case. So this is exactly what we wanted to do here, except instead of using the find STL algorithm, we've actually used a member function on the map itself. Now, what are the pros and cons of this? Well, the pros should be pretty obvious. Complexity logarithmic in the size of the container. So we know from yesterday that a map is stored as a tree of some sort um, and the keys are what's stored in the tree. So it's, it's a tree of essentially keys and each of those keys has a value. So when we try and do find on the actual member function itself, because that function is being called within the container, it can break its own abstraction and it can essentially use its knowledge of the binary tree or whatever tree it is to find it really quick because it doesn't have to linearize itself into a representation it can just use what it knows about itself <clears throat> so that's the good thing about that is that it allows you to do um, things really quickly but the downside is that it's less general so if you wanted to say change out this data structure for a different one like a vector or something you might not be able to use that anymore because, um, uh, how would you put it? Yeah, because like it needs to, like it's, it's an actual member function of the type. Um, so you, it just wouldn't work. Um, and that's why we don't like it. I mean, it, it's not we don't like it, it's like this kind of breaks a design pattern, but sometimes you want that because if you're using a map, maybe you need to find things really quickly. 
So that's just something to keep in mind, that there is a difference between using standard find with the actual iterators of the container and just using dot find, which is a member function of the container, which just happens to return an iterator. I hope that distinction is kind of clear. Um, yes, Ryan says, is it possible to use uh, the dash arrow instead of the dereference IT? Uh, yes, I just, um, I think I've started teaching with this sometimes because it's it, it kind of doesn't introduce a new concept immediately. It you know you're just building off what you already know. But yeah, both are fine I think. Um, okay, great. So a couple more algorithms to look at. Let's have a look at um, two thirteen bound. So what this one does is in this one we have a sorted vector and a sorted linked list, right? Both two different data structures stored totally differently, but in each of these cases, we want to find something, the same thing. So we want to find lower bound. So if we Google standard lower bound and we don't get a STD helpline, um, then you'll see that this returns an iterator pointing to the first element that is not less than the value. So this goes through the list and it gives you an iterator to the thing that is not less than that. So five is okay, six is okay, seven is okay, four is not okay. So this is really helpful because um, I don't think we're actually doing anything with the return here, even though we kind of should, is normally you might return something. So you might say like auto it equals lower bound, and then you say like standard C out lower bound is like um, the iterator <coughs> here, like the star D reference, which will tell you what it is. Um, and then we could do the same thing for this one too, auto it2 equals that. So this is like another simple algorithm, right? There's a whole bunch of them that's just like, can you go through that linear representation for me and can you find the first element that's not lower than this and iterate it to it. And this is actually a great example of where you would um, perhaps use standard distance because like if you ask the question now, if someone said, hey, can you show like for some reason, it's like, can you tell me how many numbers um, exist in this after you find the first instance of five or something that's not lower than five? Well, yeah, now you can actually use standard distance. So you could say, well, the lower bound is actually, well, actually, let me change that. I'll say like distance from lower bound to end is actually just standard distance, which gets given IT, which is the first instance. And then it gets given sorted vex um, dot end like that. And that's it. And now you can find the number of elements, which should give you um, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is how you can kind of like, you know, when you see a distance algorithm, you think, oh, that's kind of stupid, but it's actually because often you can use these and tie these together. And therefore your, your code doesn't become this whole cascading mess of boutique solutions. You can actually spend some time, um, you know, <laughs> reusing things that other people have made, which is really nice. And then when other people read it, they're like, oh, I know what you're doing now. Um, Algorithms with output sequences. So this one is a little bit more interesting. I think most of the algorithms we looked at so far have been like take in an iterator and just like give us some metadata about it. But I want to point you now to standard transform. And standard transform is kind of interesting um, because it actually mutates something. So let's have a look at this. What does standard transform do? It applies a given function to a range and stores the result in another range. Oh, okay, so this is super interesting. So what this does, this is basically a map function. If you, again, if we go back to like map filter reduce, is if you have like, if you have like some lowercase things here, like A, B, C. So what you actually give transform is you give it a pointer to the beginning of this, um, a pointer to the end of this, and then you might have like a new data structure ready to go like here, and then I think you might give it a pointer to this and a pointer to this. And when I say pointer, I mean iterator. And what it'll do is it'll actually transform these, in this case, into like capitals. So what, what it transforms from and to is totally up to you. But the idea of the transform function is that it essentially takes one container, a second container, and it transforms all the values one by one based on a given rule. So you probably don't you probably don't need all those iterators, but let's have a look at the code example. Yeah, you don't. So you don't need this um you don't need this one here, for instance. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, you don't need this one here. Which makes sense, right? Because like 
this is another example of like C++ like these functions will assume you know what you're doing so when you give it the start and the end of the like the initial container that makes sense because um, it's like well you, it needs to know how much it has to copy but you only give it the start of the second container because it's just going to assume that you know that the second container is big enough and it's just going to copy it in blindly because it doesn't know where the end is it's just like I'm just going to keep going till I like have the same number of elements um, so that's what we can see here is we have our s which is a string right this is our before container and we give it the start and the end right so it knows where to start and knows where to end and then after that we give it our, a new string this is like an empty string right we basically just uh, created a string that has a certain size and we've nulled all the characters so this is saying create me a string with a null character exactly this string size's length so this string has uh, 12 characters I guess or 11 I'm not sure uh, probably 11 because um, it probably keeps track of its size so it doesn't need a null operator a null character um, so it just creates a new string with 11 nulls in it basically um, and what we do here is we're trying to transform from this string into this new string um, but the rule we want to apply is this function so this is kind of like a function pointer here if you will um, upper dot begin to upper so it's saying old container the beginning of the new container and here's the mapping function to apply it to everything as you transform it and that's why if we were to then say you know standard c out print the string and then standard c out print the upper string which is a new string that's the result of the transform um, then we're gonna get let me do two one four hello world and hello world that's yelling and screaming um, so that's pretty cool right the other thing you'll notice here is that the two up is something we've kind of glossed over um, this is a little bit random but essentially like in this case all this all this predicate thing needs to be as a function that can be given um, one of the iterable values so when you iterate over a string what is each value going to be it's going to be a character right if you iterate over a vector of ints each kind of item is going to be an int so in this case each character each item is going to be a character therefore your two upper function simply needs to take a character and return a character um, all these static casts here are a bit weird I had to include them to make this compile but essentially um, all this function actually does is uses the underlying two upper function that is built into C++ which is another algorithm I believe um, I mean it's probably not an STL algorithm so STL algorithms are kind of like these big standard ones but um, it's an abstraction right you that's where I got it from because it was super confusing um, but yeah you just two upper it it just takes a character and uppercases it so that's how you would uh, that's how you would do something like that um, pretty nifty transforms another another cool one um, and then lastly we have a back inserter which we'll do this quickly and then we'll take a break so um, what a back inserter does <coughs> is it gives you the output iterator for a container that adds to the end of it so the good thing is this code is pretty simple we have a string um, hello world and um, what we're actually doing first here is we are um, using another algorithm for each to actually do like an in place transform so tra like a, a transform um, kind of goes from an old container to a new container so it creates like a new copy of it whereas a for each follows the same principle but it doesn't need the new container it just needs like the the beginning of the beginning of the old container um, the end of the old container and then it says what function am I going to apply to all the variables so after that for each is called here all the characters in that string will be uppercase um, the same string right so it's like it mutates the same string so if I build that one uh, hello world and then oh it should oh I might have gotten that one wrong maybe it uh, maybe it returns something what does it do Uh, to the result of the dereferencing every iterator in the range mm, 
I'm not sure what is wrong with this one. I'm not sure what I've confused myself on. Oh, I think the function. Why is that? Why is that even compiling? See, this is weird because I think the problem here is that the predicate I'm giving it is actually just this string here. Oh, it's upper. I don't know why two upper. That's not a valid word. I don't know why that's compiling. It should be two upper. Yeah, but I don't know why it compiled. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, now this isn't working. No member named un oopsie oopsie oopsie. Um, yeah, I don't know why that worked with just two upper. That's so weird. I'm not sure. It's <laughs> still this way. Let's look at the examples. See if I, I completely missed something. Uh, for each nums dot begin. Yeah, it should be fine. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure what debugging fun times. We're having a great time today. So I'm not sure why it's not uppercasing. I feel like we're using it wrong. So someone says, uh, does make the two upper taken a reference? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what's happening here. So it's taking in value. So we can print that out inside the two upper. Yeah, it doesn't change it. That's that's my suspicion is that it, it won't actually mutate it. It just applies to it. So I think I've got that wrong. What have I got that wrong with? For each mutate. Um, is it okay to mutate objects with for each? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, is a non-modifying sequence operation. How is it okay to modify the input sequence? Blah, blah, blah. Just give me like what the the equivalent is to mutate. I'm not sure. There'd be some kind of mutate mutation algorithm. So this one here is clearly not to mutate. It's basically just like, I, I don't think it's that it's a string constant or anything. I don't think that's the problem. I feel like the problem is that it's um, uh, like for each will apply the function, but it won't do anything with the return value. Um, but I'm just guessing it. I have to assign the result back. I don't actually know what this returns. Anyway. I don't want to get lost into this rabbit hole because we're nearing the break time. But the point, um, <laughs> the point here is that you know this one is not a transform. This one is just a standard map on the items itself. It's not actually overriding them. That's just my fault there. Um, but this was just to give you a simple example because we need to talk about um, the back inserter. So if I get myself a string here, let's actually have a talk about what this back inserter is because that's the main point of this. We just got on a tangent. Um, could be a lot of rabbit holes. So when I standard transform, I want to transform my string, my hello world string here. So we give it the start and the end. And then what did we do previously is we tried to, um, uh, in the previous example, we gave it upper dot begin. Now this made sense because for upper dot begin, um, it was like the whole string was totally empty. So we didn't really like care about where to insert it. We just wanted to insert it from the front. Whereas sometimes what will happen is you might have a string here, like say, um, uh, I don't know, let me, let me give you another example. I'll just copy this across. Is, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to populate this with all A characters now, right? Um, and let me just take this back to the previous example. I'm like upper dot begin, and this should, in theory, what's this actually going to do for me? Let's try it out. Then we can use the back inserter once we all understand the behavior. So this one now is going to give me the uppercase version of the string because I transformed it from the string begin end to the uppers begin here. And it essentially overwrote it because even though I kind of had this string full of A's here, 
like I'll show you this. We have these string full of A's, we just overwrote them because when we gave it to the transform, we gave it to the start of the string, so it just completely overwrote them. Um, I'll also print out S here. So the point of a back inserter is to allow us to easily find the back valid value, and I covered this in my tute today, so you can also have a look at that. It's to find the valid back value, not the end, but the one before it. Um, and I can show you this, for instance, if we get upper.begin, right? So upper.begin is going to give us an abstract iterator to the beginning of the upper string. If I now increase this by 2, let's see what happens. So you can see what's happened here is that the transform has started applying it to um, this part here, the, the third the third spot instead of the first, right? Because we've iterated that by two. What you've also noticed here is that the string itself hasn't actually included all of the remaining characters. Now, like, why is that? Well, it's because string is a fixed size. So when we actually allocated that string at the start, it only has so much space and memory, and it only gets reallocated when you try and do something like you push back to it or you can go read the string library. So what's actually happening here is that as I try and insert it further back, as I try and, you know, increment that iterator to which we're inserting it into, oops, that was the wrong one, um, it's just not working because there's not enough space there, right? Um, you know, we could probably get around this by uh, trying this example slightly differently, right? Um, just by, say, using a, uh, let's use a vector instead, and hopefully this, like, uh, really demonstrates the idea. So I'll call my vector of ints. I'll just call it S as well, um, and we'll use numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right, so this is my starting vector. And then for my... Uh, except we're not going to be using upper anymore, so we probably don't need that element. Will this still compile without it? See, I really love going on some like curious rabbit holes with you all, because I think it's, again, fun to explore. Though I do sometimes get really... Dubia. A vector of chars is not a terrible idea, actually. Thank you. Let's give that one a shot. I like that idea. Let's try a vector of chars. So we'll do a standard vector of chars, which is basically like a poor man's string. Um, and this one will have, you know, what? H E L L O, maybe? Like that. So we can, we for each that, but we're not talking about for each. We create a new upper vector of chars. Um, and let's just see how this goes. Playing around with STL and what it can do. Nope, we get a compile error. Um, for function style cast or type construction. Oh, we don't need that S there. Thank you. Um, and the extra comma. I missed the extra comma, but that S was the main problem here, I think. So we compile this one, still the same problem, not the same problem, still a, a problem. Um, let me get rid of this stupid thing here. Uh, invalid operands to binary expression. Ah, so now it's angry that we're trying to print it out. Now that makes sense because there's, there's no like easy way to, um, to actually print that out. So we could, you know, we could try and like do a little loopy thing. We use a for range loop, right? Like we use auto const reference of i in s, where s is the vector, and then we can just like standard c out i with another space like this, and then we can standard c out a new line at the end. So we can start with that, right? Build 2 on 5. Hello, segmentation fault. <laughs> so why have we got the segmentation fault? That's super interesting. Let's get rid of this transform. Right, because that's where the, that's where the problem is. So I'll show you this. If we get rid of this transform here, everything will work. And the reason is because what this transform is doing, right, is it is trying to go from the start of the vector and then transform and iterate them in there. But the vector is too small, I'm pretty sure. So that it's not about the plus four because the vector probably has no items in it, I would guess. Um, and we know this from the previous lecture because we can look at this just before we try and do the transform. Let's print it out. Um, S dot capacity, right? Because I, I think that was it. Because remember, a vector has a capacity, um, as in like a, a total 
size that it has currently before it has to um, resize. Now you got to remember here, I wonder why that's not working, illegal instruction. Why are we getting illegal instruction now instead of segfault? So one of the challenges you have to face with transform is that transform is not like pushback. It is not going to dynamically allocate the array for you. It is literally just like mutating pointers. And this becomes tricky because if you think about what a vector is, right? A vector, um, if you were to try and iterate through a vector right now, your vectors end iterator would just be like right at the start. So immediately when it tries to like, so it, it starts off at like upper dot begin, right? And then when it plus pluses that, it's basically plus plusing upper dot end because there's nothing in there. And remember what we said is when you mutate a, um, an end iterator, it's undefined behavior. So again, just to reiterate, you can't, if someone says to you, I want you to find me the element um, at the end of this vector, you can't say um, auto it equals s dot end and then go it minus minus. Like you can't, like s dot end is, you know, one, one after the, the last one. You can't do that and then go back. Like the end iterator is, is garbage. It's null. You can't do anything with it. That's why we actually have those things like the R begin iterators so that you can actually start at the end value. So the problem here is that a transform doesn't care what's happening with the vector. It trusts you to manage the iterators okay. And it's like, if you're calling me, I'm going to assume that upper has enough stuff in it. So we could give upper enough stuff, A, B, C, D, E, like this and try that, see if this works. This one works. Why does this one work? Because upper actually had the space to do the transform now. So if I try and print out upper, you'll see that it actually has the same values. Yeah, when the compiler tr when the compiler trusts you and you break you break its trust, right? So this one actually did it uppercase it. And if I made this one even longer, like let's make this uh, vector here longer, I might say, um, uh, you know, I'll I'll show you this, right? No space. Um, I don't know. What's a five-letter word? I can't believe I have to think about no upper. There you go. That'll do. So we got no upper here. Um, five, five-letter word. Trust. Hello. Yeah. So what'll happen here, right? Is that it will override the first five characters. But if I begin this with a plus three. Um, or a plus, yeah, plus three, it will actually move across three spots at the start. And that's actually how we could override it, for instance, here, and have like a um, uh, no hello. So it's actually overwritten the upper part because we've told it that the place to start the iterator from is actually three pass. Now, I took this example down a bit of a rabbit hole, which got us away from the point of it, which I don't really want to spend the time on uh, right away. Um, but essentially, to go back to what a back inserter is, and, and I actually did cover this in the tweet today, so you can probably go look there, is a back inserter will give you the last element of a uh, an iterable object. So again, go see the tweet today if you want to chat more about it, like see it again. Um, but you know, if you have these like five items here, and you would like to get the last item, um, you could use dot r. You could use r begin, of course. But that only works as well in cases where um, there's actually like a reversible iterator. So if I want this number five here, what can I do? Well, I can't do, and assume this is called vec. I can't do vec.end because vec.end is this magical thing here, which doesn't exist. I can't do vec.end, sorry. <laughs> vec. <laughs> I can't do vec.end uh, minus one because we know that incrementing or decrementing a dot end iterator is undefined behavior. I could do vec dot r begin, but this will only work for iterators that are mo like a, that are dual directional. So for instance, this works for a, a um, doubly linked list because doubly linked lists keep track of the front and the back, right? That's why you'll see like an r begin and a c begin. But for a forward list, which is a singly list, singly list, singly linked list, uh, it only has uh, C begin and C end. 
um, it does not have a R begin, right? So that's what this like back insert is for because you can't say R begin. That's what you normally do for any kind of bidirectional iterator. So instead, you um, you will actually have to use a back inserter. So what a back inserter does, you 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 give a, a vec to a back inserter, and it goes and gets vex begin, and it goes up. Here's where I start, and then it goes whoop 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 whoop. And then it sees the next one's the end and it says, oh, that's not what I want. So then it grabs this one. So the actual back inserter will return you a pointer to that. So that's another example of like an STL algorithm that can be useful for things that essentially you can't get to the end, right? So it does the advancing from the start to the end for you so that you don't have to write that same boilerplate code. And I think that's probably a good summary before we take the break is that a point of a lot of these STL algorithms is not to like cure cancer or anything, it's to avoid you writing more and more boilerplate code so that you don't have to like pollute your code with a whole bunch of stuff that takes away from the fundamental logic of what you're doing. Um, someone says, what happens if we plus plus a back inserter? Then you'll get the end, right? Because it's just an iterator to this point. And if you, if you plus plus the, the final iterator here, then um, you get, well, <laughs> It might be the end or there might be like more empty space or, or something, but basically it, it like takes you to the last element that's there. Okay, let's take a five minute break and then we'll get onto lambdas, which are kind of the last topic for today. Um, yeah, so I'll chat to you in five or six or seven minutes. Um, cool. Hi everyone and welcome back from the short break. Um, so we've spent the last hour basically talking about a whole range of really basic STL algorithms. Um, it probably hasn't been the most efficient use of time, and I'm, I'm sorry about that going into some of these rabbit holes, though I guess, for me at least, you know, C++ is kind of defined by its rabbit holes more than its features, right? Because that, that's where you spend your time. You probably noticed this on the first assignment, right? Like something that seems very intuitive to work. You're like, why doesn't this just work? Why do I have to read all these compile errors? What's all the detail here? Though... Um, Kind of the last major thing to talk about when it comes to um, algorithms in C++ is lambdas. Now, if you've done some other courses, you might be familiar with lambdas. Um, so bear with me, we might be a little bit slow. Though in C++, we have lambdas as well. This is something that isn't a feature of C. Um, and essentially, all lambdas are is a really succinct definition of a function. Um, that you can use in other functions. They're often defined anonymously. What that means is that the function has a definition, but that it doesn't have a name. Um, so I think what might be a good... Um, uh, I'm so confused by these code examples, these for each things. I think I've been thrown off because we like this, this code hasn't changed since last year. So maybe my brain has changed or something. Um, but yeah. It's not good. So, what I what I might do to show you here is we've we've kind of got this string here called hello world, um, and oh this one's correct. Okay, maybe I just did it wrong. Um, and we have a for each function which you know s begin to s and uh, references. Got it. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. I understand now. Thank you very much. Um, so what I want to do is I want to actually modify our previous code example. So rather than show you off demo 216, let's actually go back to a previous code example that had that um, two upper um, in it, like this one. And let's just simplify this in the lecture. So um, we're going to get rid of this. I'm going to use our for each. I'm going to do the fix that um, uh, Quinjian has kindly, kindly provided. Thank you so much for being a bigger brain than me. Um, and that is that we will um, take in a reference. So value is a reference to an unsigned char, right? Um, and let's see if this one works now. I saw it was mentioned, but it's hard, it's hard to explain. It's like when you're lecturing, um, there is, there is like, there's a lot of stuff going on in your head and on the chat, and particularly when there's debugging stuff you kind of have to just make a like r some split second choices about like um uh what you know what are you actually going to look at um and i just made the wrong choice i just listened to the wrong people 
Um, so what's what's going on here compared to this one? Now I'm like not even sure why. Oh, okay. Ugh. I see what's happening here. So let me first take this lambda. Let's just let's just copy what this lambda does, and then we can um then we can talk about it. So standard to upper value. Let's start with that. Let's see if this one works. That should work fine. No, it doesn't. Because it sucks. Uh, implicit conversion. Oh, do we need to include all those darn casts here? So here's an example. Uh, implicit. Does it need a return value? I think here that the problems with the two upper. So this is like this is an example of some of C++'s weird stuff. Um, in the previous examples, uh, it wanted um, it wanted us to cast it because it basically standard to upper implicit conversion loses integer precision. So it's saying that it's an int to a char. So if we dump standard to upper into Google, um, you can see that it actually returns an int here, um, and it actually expects it as well. So that's kind of strange for us because what it means is that we kind of need to static cast this to a char because standard to upper returns an int. And then we kind of need to static cast this one to an int because it's a char, right? Which is super strange. And this will probably still give us some grief because I didn't write it correctly. <laughs> um, but hopefully this should be okay. 2.14. Oh my god, the eternal... Yeah, okay, so it does want us to return something? I'm really confused about how that works. Oh, because it's void. I understand. Thank you. I was like, why is it trying to take return something? That shouldn't be how it works. Okay, this might... Uh, thank you, everyone. What an adventure. What an adventure we just went on together. Um, okay, so we're going to go back to 214. And you'll see that this will, you know, work as we originally expected it to, um, which is that uh, two upper is applied to every function. Um, and I and I think the kind of distinction here that I was missing before was that it, it it's not an application where it takes in a value and then it returns a value. And this is probably my JavaScript brain, which is what I work with every day working here, which is kind of how a map works in JavaScript, is that it returns a value, and that's what the, the mutation is, I guess, um, even though it doesn't actually mutate it. So I'm probably full of crap. But the point is we're actually modifying it now, right? So we pass in a reference to that value. We set the value to be the uppercase version of it, and we have to do some weird things with static cast because it's um, two upper takes in an int to an int. So that's just a shame, but that's how it is. Um, this is a normal way you would deal with this kind of predicate style function pointery thingy majig. For each takes in an iterator, an iterator, and a function. And in fact, let's see what the C library calls this function. That is not what you search in Google. Um, what it calls this function is uh, unary function, right? So what in God's name is a unary function? Unary function must meet the requirements of move constructible. Okay. Um, now, what does unary mean? Unary means one. Um, and the reason for that, I'm pretty sure, is because uh, because we're operating on like a for each element in some kind of iterable structure, it can only have one um, parameter. So it needs to be a single parameter function. If it wasn't one parameter, if it had two or more, it would fail to meet the type check for for each. Um, and then naturally the actual uh, type of the iterable here needs to match in some way. Otherwise it won't be able to do, uh, won't be able to pass it in validly. And again, it won't, it won't be type checked correctly. Um, so this works. Now, the thing is, is that if you're only gonna use this two upper function once, like literally once, um, then sometimes you wanna write it in like a slightly nicer way. Um, and the slightly nicer way you might wanna write it in is, as a lambda. Now, I usually remember lambdas in a very strange way, um, which is that you can replace a function name, and you can define the function in line, and it's made up of, bear with me, a series of three brackets, like this. 
And I remember the three brackets because my brain says, you start off with the bracket that looks the most serious and then it slowly descends into chaos. That's how I remember that. So square brackets look super rigid and square and, you know, stiff like they're wearing a suit. And then these ones are kind of bendy and curvy. And then these ones are basically drunk at this point. So that's how I remember. I usually, when I'm writing lambdas, I write them all down and then I have to sit here and try and remember um, what the hell they are. So the first one, the square brackets is, um, what you call the capture, right? Now, again, if you're not familiar with lambdas, uh, the capture is, um, so as you know, in a function, it has its own scope, where if you define this function and you use a name that's not defined inside the function scope or declared inside the function scope, it'll be like, what's that? I don't know what it is. And a capture is a way where you can essentially feed things, oops, feed things from outside the function scope into the actual function itself. So in a lot of ways, you can actually kind of ignore the the capture. This isn't capture like you know, you know what what letters is written in this image. This is capture as in like I'm going to capture your dog and keep it for myself kind of thing. Um, and the rest of this is just a normal function, right? This looks like a function, right? A function is made up of parentheses and then something in a brace. So you can just copy this in char ampersand value and then uh, what what does your actual function do? Well it just does this. So I'm just going to copy that in. Now this lambda is huge because of the static casts so this is maybe not like the ideal case for a lambda because it's quite a lengthy line here. Um, I might put this on the next line just so you can see but I'll, I'll move it out here a bit. Um, yeah, you kind of get the point. So the idea here is the lambda is the capture. These are the parameters that you take in. And then this is the body. This is actually what's executed. Now, typically lambdas are actually quite small. I don't even know if I would use a lambda for this one because it's just so big. It would be really hard to read in the code. Um, I will run a clean format. Um, I just want to visually explain that it's like, it's just this little chunk here. That's actually what the capture is. The rest of this is like inside the for loop. So I could actually get rid of this now and then try and compile it again, 214. Um, and it would work um, because it's kind of like an it's it's like an anonymous function like that's essentially what it is um, though this structure is just uh, you know what we would call a lambda so if we go back to the actual slides um, uh, it, it replaces function pointers essentially um, and th now we're getting into the uh, the anatomy of a lambda function. So we already kind of talked about this. We have the capture, the parameters, the return value, and the body. Now, the return value here, I didn't include, right, did I? I just had my three ex increasingly drunken brackets. Um, but I could include this here and say that the return type is a void. Now, I don't actually think this is necessary in this case. There might be some cases where it is necessary. Though, if, if nothing else, it does help communicate to the programmer um, what is actually happening. And the, th the funny thing is, you know how we have the C++20 function syntax where we got the little auto something like, you know, we, uh, I'll show you here. It's like we say auto main dash arrow int. One of the benefits of this syntax is that it actually aligns more with the, the Lambda captures because there's parts of C++ where you would actually define the return value this way. Um, and uh, you would, re yeah, define the return value this way. So in some ways, this like C++ 20 syntax actually helps you standardize your approach um, to these things. So yeah, uh, that's kind of how you do it. Um, you have your capture and then let's have a look at what some of those things are. So here's another simple example and let's just dump this straight into our editor and run it. Oh, we already have it. I'm prepared, I guess. Um, so in this case, we have a main function with a vector of three elements. Um, again, hint for your assignment. We expect you in your assignments to write things like this, right? Um, auto v equals standard vector int with that. And then we call add n. And add n takes in the vector and it takes in n. Now, what in God's name is n? Well, in this case, add n is saying that I would like to add a particular number numerically to every single element in my vector. So I'd like to add three to all of the vector elements. And we can do that pretty simply, right? We take in our vector, um, we take a reference, we take a reference so that 
it works and it's also quicker, right? References are quicker. Hint, hint, assignment one if you haven't figured that out. Um, and n, and then we do standard for each, where we give it the vector begin, the vector end, and then we give it a lambda. Now what's, what's special about this lambda? Well, what's special about it is that we actually are putting something in the capture. So the rest of this makes sense, um, where you have your parameters, which is an int, a reference to an int, because every time it loops through it, it wants to take that, that int and it wants to modify it. And it modifies it by simply saying val equals val plus n, or val plus equals n if you want. Um, yeah, or, it's, yeah, that's fine. Um, but we need the capture because the actual function is doing something that requires information um, that can't be all found and generated inside the function. Because typically these unary functions will just take one element, which is the value, and then they'll do something. Like two upper didn't need any context. Whereas this function needs context because how much it actually increases a by is based on n. And if you don't have n here, I'll show you what happens. We go and build it. And then it says n cannot be implicitly captured in a lambda um, with no capture default specified. I'm not sure what the message means. Oh, implicitly captured. So basically here, um, I'm not sure if this would work with less strict compilers. I genuinely don't know. We could probably try it. Let's try and just like run something random in um, with just G++, raw G++. No, oh, still doesn't like it. N is not captured. Okay, this is what just the standard uh, G++ gives us. You can see G++ is also complaining about some libraries as well, which is quite interesting. Because for each is uh, its own library, which we haven't included here, which we really should. Um, it's in algorithm. Tisk tisk. Um, yeah, so we need to actually include n here. Now, that will make it work because it's outside, and essentially what that means is that C++ will make the value of n visible in the scope of this function, right? Um, and we're going to explain some subtleties of this that are quite critical that I don't think I have slides for, which is good because I can just explain it. So here's a couple things to pay attention to with the... Uh, the, the lambda. Um, first thing, let's compile this just to make sure I didn't break anything. Oops, that's not what I wanted to compile. So I can, what have I done? Oh, 21, random 21. Cool, um, simple. Now, watch what happens now if I would like to um, uh, do this a few times, just randomly. I, I would just like to for each it a few times. This will just increase it a lot now, right? It'll go from, you know, 4, 5, 6 to 10, 11, 12. Uh, that's not how you compile. That's not how you compile either. That's how you compile, except uh, we're not printing anything. In fact, I don't even know what I was doing before. I must have just been compiling and ignoring what was output. <laughs> okay, so let's iterate through this vector. Um, for const auto reference uh, item in B, uh, we'd like to standard C out. In fact, you could use a for each for this. Let's just do that. Let's do that after we do this. I'm really dragging this lecture on longer than I think I wanted to, but again, I like exploring these things. Um, East const, by the way, east const, wrong side. What's the complaint? Unused variable items, because I'm not printing item out. So here we go. Perfect, we run it, we get 10, 11, 12. Let's do this with a for each now as well. Standard for each, I think we can do it with a for each. v.begin, v.end, and then let's make a capture. The capture takes in nothing, um, the parameters are an int reference. Um, val, and then we're just going to standard C out item, and then that. There we go. What am I doing wrong? 
Um, it's called val, not item. Got it done. That should work for us now. And what you'll notice in this case is that in a lot of ways, it's actually cleaner because um, we're not having to do any of the four range stuff, right? Like we're just like, all right, we just want to iterate over this. Um, I mean, maybe this one's not cleaner per se. It's different. Um, but the point is a lot of the time you can replace loops. Anytime you do a loop over a container, there's probably an algorithm that will help you do what you want to do. Um, so now I want to show you some things with lambdas. Um, first thing, we can define lambdas. We don't have to put them inside functions. So I just want to explain lambdas uh, can be defined as named functions. They don't have to be anonymous. They just can be anonymous. And what I mean by that is I could say, um, I'm going to make like a, my function is called increment. I think this works. So this also works because I'm literally just taking this, which is a function. It's kind of like a function pointer and I'm just storing it here. Generally speaking, you never, ever, ever define functions anonymously if you use them more than once. You might want to use the lambda syntax to make it a little quicker um, or a little cleaner, but you know this might be how you start and I'll give it a void just to be really clear. Now, this will also work. This will increment everything three times. However, watch what happens when I increment n. So n is the number that's passed in its three. I want n to increase by three before we actually iterate through things. How will this output change? So this output will not change because what happens is the capture when it's by value is captured at the, the moment of definition of the function. So if you think about this program flow, line 9 defines the function, but lines 13 to 15 actually execute it. So the body of this function, the value of n, is not actually resolved until it's called on lines 13, 14, and 15. But the capture is caught and captured at the moment of definition. Um, and that's really important because captures can be passed to, captured by value, and then they can also be captured by reference. So if I actually put an ampersand at the end of this and rerun this, you'll see what happens here. It, oh, I'm doing it wrong, aren't I? Oh, is it, what is it again? Is it that? Oh, this syntax always confuses me. Oh, that's really weird. So you write it out the front like it's an address. I don't like, oh, I guess that makes sense. I guess that, uh, I guess that makes sense because you're like in reference n as a reference to n, but no, I'm probably just stupid. So this means captured by reference, right? So now when we run this, watch what happens. We get 19, 20, and 21. And that's because even though we um, recorded here that we're going to capture the end by, we're going to capture it, we captured it by reference, which means that when we actually use it inside the function call, it is using a reference to n um, of where it's kind of used in the function here. So the value here is 3. We capture it by reference, so we, we kind of store this reference inside the, the lambda scope, um, which is just a reference to n. And then we increment n by 3, and then at the function call point, it's now using an n that's 6, right? Because it's 3, and then we increased it by 3, and since it was captured by reference, um, it's now the higher value. So that's basically something to keep your mind on, is, uh, you know, these capture by reference, capture by value things. So changes made to the reference inside the lambda would also change others. Oh yeah, it would, but God, you would be a monster. Like that would just be bad programming. Like I guess you could do n plus equals one here. Oh, I'm getting, oh, feeling sick just thinking about it. Ah, 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 that's some terrible code. <laughs> yeah, sure. If you want to be a monster, go for it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's all doable. Um, anything's doable. Um, just while we were going through this lecture, uh, <laughs> I also think I realized what actually went wrong with some of the... So you know how in the examples here, um, I had... Which examples was it? We had some examples with uh, the two upper stuff like this. So we didn't run demo 216. This is with the first two upper. And I want to see what happens if we try and build it.
So... Oh, it's because I modify it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's get rid of this cast. That's what I wanted to test. I was a bit flabbergasted then. I was like, oh, that's not good. That's not what I wanted to happen. So let's build this as, as per the lecture slides. Now, as you can see, this doesn't compile and it's complaining about the implicit conversion loss. So I just want to give some context as to what's happening here. If I try and compile this, let me, let me hash include algorithm. If I try and compile this directly with um, uh, G++, right? So inside lectures two, I'm just going to go G++ demo 216. It compiles and I can run it, right? Why does it not compile when I build it? And the reason is because G++ by itself, even with the wall where uh, flags, will tolerate it. But what we're actually using in this course um, is like with CMake, I, I don't know what it is off the top of my head because again, the, the actual environment was largely set up by Chris. <laughs> yeah, G++ is looking kind of sus. Um, but essentially, the, the environment that we've set up has a whole bunch of other flags um, that stop you doing things. So that's, that's pretty much like why a couple of these lecture slides um, give us grief because I do test them all though I maybe am a terrible person who's not capable um, or maybe accidentally miss a couple of them but I would have just missed that one but yeah essentially this would be fine normally but there's some extra flags here and you can actually see it when you build like if you try and build this you actually see the flag that triggered this um, yeah so it's it's right well you can see a bunch of them here but if you go down here it'll actually show you that this implicit conversion loses precision because int to char loses precision four to one bytes um, implicit int conversion so this is a warning that's being thrown as an error um, by the implicit int conversion so that I'm just kind of giving you some con I mean you know this whole world is a crazy world right um, but this is some context as to why this line of code was like in the lecture slides because I think when we ran this last time, it was fine because I think we were running it with G++ previously. Um, but in this case, it's actually failed because of this implicit conversion. Um, so, you know, this is just another reminder that this all this stuff is very complicated and, um, you know, different build systems, different environments. It's, it's not quite as virtualized as some other things like Java, Python, uh, JavaScript. Um, we're pretty much at the end. I think there's only a couple things to talk about, which are iterator categories. So, I, I again, I actually talked about this in my tutorial today. So, if your tutors didn't, you can go to my tutorial and like just jump to the end. Um, and so, but I'll just touch on it very briefly, which is that um, when we talk about containers and algorithms being super general where any container can be used by any algorithm and any algorithm can operate on any container um, that's not strictly true um, because certain algorithms require certain levels of iterators and certain containers only provide levels of iterators and I know this is really random but I remember I remember talking to a pilot once I was somewhere overseas and I was talking to a pilot who was telling me about like um, you know, planes when they land, right, is like every airline, pilot, plane, and airport or something is rated to a certain, like, capable landing, right? So you might have a super advanced plane, but a crappy airport or a super advanced airport and a crappy plane and untrained pilots and stuff. And there are all these different levels of landings. And I think the top, top level of landing was like category 3C or something. I'm, this is five years ago, so I've forgotten. But um, basically, it's like landing with zero visibility, right? Um, and A380s can do this. I'm pretty sure Dubai Airport can do this. So there's, there'll be instances in some of your lives where um, planes have landed with like the pilots never having any visibility in front of them, like zero visibility. And like to do that, you need all these things to be true. Um, and I don't know why, but I remember thinking about that earlier today because it reminds me a little bit of algorithms and containers where it's like you have algorithms that might be like super capable of stuff and they need to, you know, have certain criteria met and then you have containers and only like it doesn't always work, right? So you have really simple algorithms like advance or next, which are just, they only go forward through things. They pretty much just increment. That's all they do. 
And they're really, like, Advance is a great one. Advance is like one of the dumbest algorithms out there. It just advances the iterator. And you can see here, all these different types of iterators have the plus plus method. So it can, it can happily advance anything. But um, let's have a look at this one. If you go to standard search, which is an algorithm that, what does it use under the hood? I don't remember. Someone might know. Um, I don't think it's linear. What's the time complexity? Depends on the searcher. Oh, is this not... Does this take in a... I'm not too sure. I can't remember. I remember there was a binary search of some kind in C++, but now I'm... Oh, here it is. Oh, it is here. Great. I thought it was just going to be called search. Um, but basically in C++, there's a binary search but I'm pretty sure it says it only needs a forward iterator. That seems really weird. I thought it needed... Ah, okay, cool. So, yeah, I'm on the wrong website. I'm sorry. It was just, it was just further up in Google. Please don't get mad. Um, so this one's actually really interesting um, because it's actually showing you here that like this binary search... Um, algorithm, which you can see takes in like a V begin V end and a thing you're searching for. It says it's logarithmic um, in, in general, but if you give it a non-random access iterator, um, it becomes linear, right? And this kind of makes sense because a vector's, a vector's um, uh, iterator is random access. So what that means is that like if you have a you know, if you, I'm just writing this here, but like, you know, if you have a vector that's like 10 elements and you say like it equals uh, v dot begin and you want to you want to do a uh, binary search on it, right? And you know it's 10 elements. Let's just say like int size equals 10. Well, how do you do a binary search? You'd be like, oh, well, uh, my first check is going to be it plus 5, the middle. And then it's like, well, if it's less than, right? Like if, uh, you know, if first check is, is less than my needle, uh, then I'm going to say, you know, it plus equals 2.5, right? I mean, we all get binary search. It's like you just keep narrowing in. But you can do that because it's a random access iterator. So to actually do that with a vector, the iterator can actually jump five spots in constant time. It just does it because the iterator itself can be moved because it's a contiguous bunch of memory. It makes sense. The iterator is very powerful. But then if you go to, say, a, um, a doubly linked list, all it's capable of doing is bidirectional iteration, which means that it can go forward, it can go back, but it can't be looked up directly. It can't do plus equals and it can't be minus equals, right? That's all it can do. Um, so this is like a doubly linked list here because a doubly linked list doesn't have random access. You should know that because of about linked list. And then forward is a similar, except it can't go backwards because it only points to the next one, right? Um, so the point is that different algorithms behave differently and some algorithms will expect certain things. So in the case of binary search, I thought it only took random access iterators. But what it actually looks like, looking at it more, which I maybe didn't fully understand, is that it, it seems like it will actually take all, like all these iterators, like forward, bidirectional, and random access, but that it won't give you the performance benefits on forward and bidirectional. It can only do the log n in, in random access. So the point is, this is something to consider because um, some containers can't give you random access iterators, some containers can't give you bidirectional iterators, etc. So keep this in mind. Um, you'll kind of see this loitered around websites like forward iterator and stuff like that. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind. But yeah, um, I think that's about it for tonight. <laughs> How did I click on that tab by accident? And why is that good? What did I... Oh, okay. I clicked on something. I'm, I was like, I'm losing my mind. All right. So, um, when might you want to use a Lambda expression? Uh, pretty much any time you're writing a really tiny function. That's about it. Like, if you're just writing... And, and sometimes you can actually use algorithms kind of as Lambdas. Um, but, yeah, it's, you, you come across it. It's just going to be tiny functions. Um... 
So that's pretty much it for today. So uh, just for context, um, we will go through um, class types next Tuesday. I wanted to start it today, but like this was good to spend some time on. Um, this stuff isn't really that critical for the assignment. I don't think it really matters, to be perfectly honest with you. It's all about classes and constructors. In fact, it's definitely not critical for the assignment. So doing it next Tuesday sounds fine. Um, so just in terms of lectures, what we'll probably see is uh, that we will um, keep the schedule exactly how it is, uh, which is do this next Tuesday, and then after that we'll do these two the following week, um, which should be fine. So... Yeah, sounds good. Um, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, this wasn't one of my favorite uh, lectures in terms of like, I, I don't like, occasionally you have one of those lectures where you just get stumped by a few things. It's the price I pay for trying to be a bit more dynamic um, and explore things with you rather than like, uh, uh, you know, just be like, here's a predefined example. Um, so sorry about that. I know a lot of you will be like, oh, it's fine. But no, I'm genuinely sorry. You pay money to uni. Uni pays money to me. So we make sure that we uh, do a good job. Um, but thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for everyone watching the recording. Uh, good luck this weekend with the assignment. Um, last quick thing is that um, Simon, one of the tutors, is writing up a post, um, and we're all checking it to post on the forum pinned, that is like how to write tests. Um, oh, wait, no, so that one's already pinned. Let me find the post that Simon made. So I'll just show you now because it'll be up soon, but um, Simon's basically helping write a post uh, that just gives a bit more information on like how to write tests. And I just have to double check it. He did it like, you know, during the lecture. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully, because I know there's been a few questions about that, um, just around testing and, and stuff like that. Um, and again, yeah, if anyone has any, if anyone's bored and they want to share some, look, there's nothing here. There's nothing in the fun section. Um, that's really sad. Someone post something fun and then someone else be friendly and then we can all be friendly together. Um, yes, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great night um, and talk to you all next week. And I'll see you on the forum throughout the week.